I became aware of Daniel's work about four or five years ago, and I've been watching him uh, without his awareness <laughs> in that time. And uh, I just got to a point where I had to make contact with, with Daniel. Uh, his works contain for me everything I seek in, in painting. Um, I mentioned in the, uh, the uh, press release, two of the things I personally seek in art are beauty and elegance. And beauty is, is not about being pretty, it's about honesty, it's about truth. It's a, it's a, a very large sort of concept. And elegance for me is when you can't add or subtract anything. It's absolutely perfectly resolved. These paintings contain those things. And in order to achieve that, there, of course, what's required is a mastery of technique and vision and all kinds of things. So anyway, I called Daniel and uh, we had a wonderful chat, uh, listening to this beautiful Scottish accent on the other end of the phone. And uh, we uh, decided to do some work together. <coughs> uh, the result has been this exhibition, and I just could not be more happy with, with uh, having Daniel here. So without anything further, I'd like to introduce Daniel. Daniel, are you still here? I was trying to open the door. Daniel Mullen. Daniel's here with his wife Lucy, who is a part of Daniel's process, but I'm sure Daniel's um, And instead of an actual formal talk, Daniel thought the best way to do this would be more like a question and answer. So um, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you. And, uh, yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to be here and uh, share this work with you. Um, so the work. I think the nice thing to do would be to maybe, if someone has one question, where we can start and then that will bring us into a, a path and then we'll follow and we'll take us where that goes. Uh, has anyone got a question? Mm -hmm. like What's your process? What's the process? Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the synesthesia work, uh, maybe we can go, maybe we'll go with this one. Uh, first, it's from this, the synesthesia series with Lucy. Maybe Lucy, you'd like to come up. I'd like to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so this is Lucy, and we make this work together in, in a second. I'm getting a bit nervous. Oh. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm getting a bit nervous with this sort of thing. Maybe you could start and then I'll Sure, yeah. So um, I have synesthesia, which is this different way of perceiving numbers and letters and color and time. And so when I first met Daniel, I saw he already was working in a painterly language that made me think he had synesthesia, but he didn't, um, sad for him. Um, but I, I thought maybe he could help me realize visually what I experience inside my own mind. And so we started working on a series pretty early on in our relationship that has really culminated for me in this work, especially because this is a representation of all of the number digits in color that make up all other numbers. So, you know, every number is composed of zero to nine. And so these are all the colors of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, with a little zero on the end. And this is a representation of decades. So um, you have, you know, 10, so through time, a century, the decades of a century. Um, but the question was about your process. Yeah. Okay. So, so thank you guys. Okay. So, um, um, when, when the, the the process, so basically, I start the work. Uh, so once we figure out what the colors going to be and how we're going to set up the work, then uh, I start by drawing up the, the the back lines, and then I need to figure out what the perspective is, and then I. When I know the perspective, so this one is different to all the rest in the fact that if you look at this one, all the all the lines go into a vanishing point in the center, and then from there you, the work like fans out, all the segments are fanning out. With this one, if I would have taken the same process, then this line at the back that goes down, that would have ended up all the way over here, and the whole work would have been incredibly compressed in the center. 
so you wouldn't have been able to have all these uh, gradations. So each line in the back has its own uh, separate uh, vanishing point as it, as it goes along, but then from, from standing back and seeing it, it feels like it all goes to one point. Um, so the, the work, so as Lucy said, the work starts on either side at zero. So each individual line accounts for one year in a decade. So there's five zeros here and five zeros there, and that makes up the the, begin, the, the turn of the century, let's say. And then here you've got 10 lines of uh, a navy blue, which uh, represents uh, the 90s, for example. So in the, um, yeah, so maybe we'll go over here and look at this one. This one is a representation of, um, not decades, but uh, the crossing of the, what we talked about, this one. Uh, this is a different perspective. So with this one over here, where the perspective is that we're looking at time from above, so the, the decades passing from above, and this one we're actually looking at uh, two sections or two channels of time uh, from, uh, from the front. So you've got the, the orange, which is the six on one side, and then there's seven, which is the, the turquoise on the other. So this would be like, say, uh, the the thousandth line, and then that's the century line next to each other. And so if this would continue, you would have another one here, this would be the decades, and then another one would then be the individual years. So that's when it would be in front of you. And uh, this one is then, uh, what is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> this is where you have, uh, it crosses from uh, one, I think this is, this could either be centuries and uh, decades, yeah, next to each other. And you've got the eights, then the ninths, and then the, the twos and the threes. Um, okay, so then uh, what I'd like to talk about is that uh, the work comes from, so basically what happened with Lucy and this idea of uh, translating something is kind of a, a reason to paint. We all need reasons to start something, right? So for me, um, uh, having Lucy's, uh, translating Lucy's in synesthesia is a way for me to try and build a relationship with colour. Because colour is something that's highly complex and is all the, the when, when you put like a, a circle on a wall, let's say a red dot, right? When, when you have that red dot in isolation, it only refers, it's only referring to itself and the space around it. But as soon as you put a dot next to another dot, then there's a relationship happening, and then there's, you're, you're like, quantifiably, there's more possibilities, more situations happening. When you have three dots, et cetera, it goes on and expands and expands. So with color, we also have this very complex relationship that's, that works on many different layers and levels, um, emotional, intellectual, visually, it can have reference to your past, it can, there, there's so many things going on. And it's like, how do you judge? How do you judge what you're seeing and how, 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 how do you know how to relate to that and how to develop that? So for, for me, the synesthesia series was a great way to somehow, on a rational level, understand color and try and explore what's going on there. So there's two series that are, are you're seeing here. You're seeing a series that's coming from a rational um, understanding of color in the sense of Lucy's logic that I'm translating. And then you've got another series which is more a um, subliminal, subconscious um, approach to color. Like, I, I don't know what the relationships are. There's nothing that I can put on paper, say, okay, two is pink and three. Is, so if you look at those two paintings over there, for example, that's a bit, it's not related to synesthesia, but I'm using the synesthesia series as a sort of, sort of setting off point to look at colour and see what the relationships are with uh, different colours. So the, these ones are just like, a, are, are very, very formalistic. I'm just like taking a, um, a, a rectangle or, and then repeating that rectangle in, in like defining lines and then putting it into a, a vanishing point in the centre and using like a dark tone in the centre on both of them, which is actually the same, but then so can be trans, trans, like, yeah, you migrate through the darkness into the, the yellow or the, into the pink, 
they can change the relationship. And it's about a relationship between two colors in isolation of each other. And as you can see in the, the, the work behind you, you have uh, six paintings that I consider actually as one work that are all, uh, it's about the relationship between what's happening between, if you look at these two in isolation from the rest, then, then the, the relationship between these two colors, this one is influencing this one as this one influences this, and then when you look at these two, this, these, the tones of this then start to change, and it is relating to this one, mm. and, and, and so forth. Mm. So that's on a, on a, like a painterly level what's what I'm interested in. Um, on another level, I think um, what, what I'm interested in is, maybe I can go back. So this wasn't going to be like a presentation of my shooting, but a very, very long answer. <laughs> um, when, um, so for, for me, I'm just going to tell you my genesis, and maybe that's actually helpful. For me, when I started, um, as a child, I had a very strong imagination. So I would go into a space, and I could look at the space, and the space would, I could, without the means around me, I could like look at the space, and it would start to transform and change. And that was something that was very interesting to me. Like uh, for my imagination, it really stimulated a lot of things. And as I was growing, getting older, that relationship changes. Like you. you your, your direct relationship with your imag imagination doesn't really exist anymore and you need to find other means. So for me, the canvas became that window into that relationship with my imagination. So um, I started painting space. Uh, the, the, I, I would start by photographing space that I thought was exciting. And exciting, I mean that it could go beyond what you're actually seeing and it stimulated a uh, and my imagination. So I would start photographing uh, architecture and then going into the studio and painting it. And what I started to realize is that there was a lot of, um, I was like, do I want to become an architect? Is that something that would be interesting to me? And then what I realized is there's a, no offense to any architects here, but there's a lot of things about architecture that's got rather boring, like figuring out where the, the, the pipes and the building are going to go. And there's so many things that are like kind of mundane, personal to me. So I was like, oh, a lot of respect to architecture. <laughs> like, so for, for me, I was like, all I'm interested in is looking at space and seeing how I can manipulate it and how it could transform and be multiple things at the same time. So uh, thinking like that, then I was looking at these photographs that I'd taken of architecture. And I also have to put something in, is I was really into brutalist architecture, and still am. Um, because the brutalist architecture, you, you have the, the way they construct the buildings is there's a lot of angles, and the way light, light falls on things, it like, looks like it could be something else, and it looks like it could be bigger and different. And it's not just like an apartment building that can be very regular, repetition of the same shape, but it, Brussels architecture often has like very irregular things going on in it, which really stimulate the imagination. So I was taking uh, photos, translating them into paintings, and realizing that there's a lot of information that I actually want to leave out of the paintings. Um, so then I was starting to take away scale. And the reason that I didn't think scale was important for the work was that scale kind of births us, right? So it's, it's that we really understand us in relationship to what we're seeing. So when you take away scale, then you're also taking away your physical relationship, and it becomes more of a cerebral relationship. And that I thought was interesting, especially using painting as the, the, the way to, to visually communicate. Because a, a painting is also like a window into another space, and then in another realm. So I thought taking away scale would be a really good starting point for the work. And then taking away things like a light switch or anything that would like reference that. And then I start to think, yeah, but what is the what's the mental space that I'm creating for myself? Like, do I need a, a, an external stimuli in order for me to be able to create a space that could be a stimulant also for the viewer? And I kind of was through a, a process and I started to realize that maybe that's unnecessary. So I started to simplify the, the, the spaces down and the work became a lot more simple. And the reason that, that was really important was because I wanted to only create a framework for communicating with the viewer. So if 
there's too much information that I don't think I can really connect with the viewer. What I want the work to be is only, uh, I, want it, I want the work to be a mirror for the viewer's own experience. Uh, now we're seeing a question, so that's great. Hi. Hi. For, for me, um, your paintings succeed or fail uh -huh. in the vanishing point. Okay. And you seem to keep the vanishing point ambiguous. Uh -huh. So I'm interested in what you believe your relationship is with the vanishing point. That's interesting. Um, so I think that, that for me the, the vanishing point is a central, it's, it's kind of like, it's about, I use the vanishing point to position the viewer where I want, them to, I want to position them. And um, that's just kind of as far as it goes. So if I, when, when I put the vanishing, and often when you'll see most of the work, the vanishing point is in the center of the painting. And I kind of use that as, when, when you look at something and you, you, you're, you're trying to orientate yourself like where you want to, where you feel that the relationship is happening, then if, if that's in the center, then what happens is you, you're just experiencing the work and the work is going out in all directions. And I kind of want the work to go beyond the confines of the canvas in your mind, right? So that's why I think I, the, 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 the center point, I placed the vanishing point in the center of the work. So you're substituting that for uh, allowing the viewer to enter the vanishing point. Well, I don't know how you would, but I think that might happen cerebrally. Like, you maybe you maybe you go through the vanishing point. I'm not sure. But you can if it's ambiguous. Well, I don't know. Maybe I don't know if everyone else agrees with that or not. Yeah, maybe I don't know. Can you talk about how you create? Um, so I use a lot of um, the process of making the work is uh, starting to draw uh, with pencil and then uh, uh, I add. Um, over the pencil layers, I put uh, a layer of, uh, like for example, with this one, uh, I put a layer of uh, acrylic paint, and I use paper tape to uh, uh, to like markate the boundaries of the paint, and then when that, all that's up, then I start to bring on layers of uh, very watered down uh, acrylic paint, and then um, after that dries, I add another one and another one, and then slowly but surely that builds up the saturation of color. And then the, the white, for example, the white paint then starts to shine through, but then with the yellow on top, so then it kind of falls. Yeah. But there's a lot of paper tape involved. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> yeah. Any so chance like to correct? <coughs> Sorry? Any chance to correct when you make a mistake? Um, if, if, I, if I see it as a mistake, um, then I will correct it, and that is that is possible. Um, um, but yeah, you you would if if the mistakes disappeared, you wouldn't see it. Like I can do that well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, both, everything here that I leave that are like irregularities are kind of important for the work. I think for me that's more about this idea of like what is how 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 we interact with like, or how we define beauty or something that uh, has, uh, and that, that's kind of in the regularity of things, right? If something's too perfect, it is like static. And uh, then, then, then it's like, how, how are we relating to things? So I, I, li I like the irregularities to be present so that the, also the, the craftsmanship can be seen, that the hand of the, the maker is there. Because the, the visual language is also like a kind of, um, it's, there's a digital aspect to the work. And that, that maybe touches on another point that I'm interested in. It's like, uh, we're, we're kind of in this age of the digitalization of our world and also our <coughs> minds as well, where it's becoming a lot more, we're a lot more interconnected. And, but that also creates like this strange relationship that like, how are we re really relating to the, re the world around us? And with, I kind of want to speak to that through the 
implementing like a visual language that seems digital, but then when you see it, it kind of reminds us of this craftsmanship and earthly processes that are involved. And I want to somehow juxtapose those in a time when we're maybe questioning or needed to be reminded of that. Yes. The way you described the history of coming to pain, you didn't talk about all about color. Was it when you met Lucy that the color emerged in your work? It didn't sound like you were doing a lot of drawing and uh, yeah. with a, you didn't mention color. Right, that's, that's true. Um, no, I, I was definitely busy with color before uh, I met Lucy. Um, and then I, I was always trying to find like reasons to use color, or like how can I justify my use of color? But so why, why did you feel you had to justify? Um, well, I, <laughs> maybe that's just to do with the, 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 the my, my history, or like um, I went I went to an art school in the Netherlands called the Gerrit Liefeld Academy, and it's a, a, a conceptual art school, and there there um, there was. You have to like kind of you're asked or expected to be able to like talk about every aspect of your work and really be able to justify why you're doing what you're doing, and so to kind of um, speak to that, I was uh, like trying to figure out like okay, well, why why this color? Why not another color? And for uh, so, so for me, I was like I, I was using colors which. Um, I had a relationship to in my history. So for example, I was very into a certain teal color, which uh, I remember from uh, the bus buses in Glasgow. But then it's a memory and I can't really define that color, right? So then that becomes this romantic notion of trying to figure out that color. So you keep doing it and then you kind of come to this conclusion, okay, I can't really remember what that color is. So then I have all these very versions of that color, but none of them are actually it. But that's also a reason to use that color. So, um, yeah. Is there any way of knowing whether you see those colors the same way we do? That's a good question. Yeah. Do you want to... I wonder if that old child, like from the earliest consciousness, I think we all do, yeah, how do we use see blue or yellow? I think some all over Sachs did some research into that. <laughs> There's some now uh, papers in that, like how we perceive color, and it does seem that everyone perceives it quite differently. Like your 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 relationship to red is, I mean, it's all within a ballpark, but it's quite different, I'm sure. Yeah, but I think we're we're also kind of taught how to to think of color. Right? We're taught that yellow is yellow. Right, but that's good in relationship to how we experience yellow. When you have a color but different shade, um, uh -huh. do you count it as the same number or? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's a very yeah. important difference. So it's, yeah, blue, or this, this blue here, this one, is extremely different than the blue that mine is. It's very stark. And what doesn't come across in painting a translation of synesthesia is texture and quality. So something might have that color, but it also has a watery quality versus a metallic quality. Mm -hmm. So it's very different. But of course, painting. Is different We're working in this language. The right of mentions time. Yeah. No. Uh, Anna talked about decades and so on. Is there anything more to the concept of time in these paintings than that? Yeah, yeah. How in depth do you want me to go? It's, it's kind of, um, uh, yeah, I, mean, I see time in a very spatial way. So you can go the micro, the seconds are out to the million years, and they all have undulations and so the, the whole shape that we're in. Um, and this kind of idea that we've settled on of these, these kind of almost glass panes to demarcate the years is when you look at it from this perspective or orientation, but as far out you go or as in you go, there's experience of it. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> that is very fascinating by it. Uh, yeah. I, 
Yeah, I wish I had it, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the closest I can get to it is painting it. Um, yeah, so I think it's very fascinating. Yeah. I'm really interested in the kind of the curve that mm -hmm. is produced by the crisscross of the right. lines. Right, the Maury effect. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wonder if that's something you consciously work into your paintings or right. just a byproduct of the lines. So it's something I definitely try to highlight because it seems like it's, it's something that, that is almost like uh, greater than some of its parts, right? It's something that only comes through uh, the relationship between all the other things that are happening there and then that becomes like a byproduct of that, which I find really interesting. So it's something I do try and highlight, but yeah, um, you, yeah it's quite, it's quite prominent in this one that yeah. becomes like two wings. Yeah. I kind of, yeah. It's something I wanted to definitely, especially on this scale, it's yeah, nice yeah. to have that there. Do you anticipate all the effects as you're producing the work? For example, uh, especially with the blues and greens, if you view it at about a 20 or 30 degree angle, suddenly the background recedes and it becomes very three-dimensional. Is that something you would plan as you're working? <laughs> so it's from here, right? Yeah, about a 20 or 30 degree angle if you, if you stand back a bit. Okay. Uh, for me, the background recedes dramatically yeah. and it becomes very three-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, I don't know if that's that. I, I would, I would say that's also a byproduct. So it's just a happy accident. It's well, it repeats a lot, so I don't know if it's an accident. <laughs> but uh, because there are other pieces, especially with the vertical yeah. uh, foreground, that have that same effect. Right, right. I mean, I think my my intention, my my that isn't my intention. But what, what I'm really working on is getting the gradation working in the work. And I think that just like becomes like a byproduct of that. So that's that's something you'll see in all the work is like it's really about trying to create that that um, color gradation and that that works in a lot, in a as subtle way as possible. But that is still defined because if it wasn't defined, if it was too light, then you wouldn't get what you were just talking about these these points that go along that create this secondary image that isn't painted but in your eye. And one last question, where do you yeah. position yourself when you're doing the work? Because it, it has a different character, subtle character, uh, depending on how far away you are from the painting. Right. Um, so to make the big decisions in the work, I'm at quite a distance. And to, um, um, but a lot of, yeah, it's just, you're, you're all over the place. <laughs> you're not just in one, you're not in one place, but there's, when I'm making the work, there's a ton of tape on this painting, right? So um, what happens is that I mark off an area that goes over the whole thing and then I'm painting this whole area. And then I leave that tape on and then I mark off the next area and paint those, those glazing layers. And it becomes more concentrated and concentrated and concentrated. And then at some point, it's just covered in a ton of tape. So you can't, you can't, you know, it doesn't matter how far back you step, you just can't see the image anymore. So then, you, you, then you're at this point where you're okay, like how dark do I want to go? And then you're at the, the center point. And what I do, what is important for me is that you still see the lines at the back. So it's like that fine balance of like uh, not going too dark because then the, the back disappears, but then being dark enough that there is enough of a gradation. So then when you're in the middle, then you're starting to like tear off each layer and then paint paint it again, tear off a layer, and then it's when you're back out, you've taken off all the, the layers, then you can really see it, but then you can't really, really see it because all these lines have disappeared. So you've got all, you've got the background, but you don't have the foreground. Mm -hmm. So you get the background and the midground, but you don't have the foreground. So you have to then repaint all the top lines, and when that's done, then you can step back, and then you can see if it's working or not. And with this one in particular, there was a lot of that. I finished it maybe three times, and I was like, "No, it's not right. No, it's not right." So it's uh, it's a complex process. It's not yeah. With like a, a work like this, it's like slightly. Uh, it's a different process. That with this, I'm much more making the decisions at this distance. If you know what I mean. And then to to think about the work as a whole. Like all the pieces individually, then I'm back here making those decisions, and then fine tuning them together. So like the the work on the left wall here, 
uh, the the, the, the that that was what made the la the final stage of the work were done from quite a distance. Okay, that was a good <laughs> answer. <laughs> Would you uh, like to highlight any particular artists that you would see as influencing the style? Maybe as your, your method? Um, but there's quite a there's a lot of different artists that have that I the different aspects of their work speak to me. But I'm I, I wouldn't say I'm trying to replicate any artists or anything like that. Nothing like that. But um, yeah, Mondrian for certain reasons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Julie Moretu for other reasons, and um, she's an Ethiopian artist, doing a lot of work. And Donald Judd for other reasons. Um, there's, there's, there's a fair while. Yeah, there's a fair while. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what about Agnes Martin? Agnes Martin, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, yeah, she's quite special. Or very special. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And there's a lot. There's really a lot out there. It's hard to put the names on them. Yeah. But it's like with every artist, there's something. I think what it is is that we're each artist in their own ways, on their own path, searching for their own questions and answers. And with some artists, you can recognize a correlation with your own search. But then you know that because you are who you are, you have the curiosity, you have to even make the same work. But there's something in them that makes a commonality. And that's something to then draw upon and say, okay, that's that's a, a good approach that I can like, bring into my own work. Did you know anything of Joseph Carl's work previous to meeting Paul? Or? <laughs> I actually didn't. I felt yeah. But I've been I've been honored to be able to see his collection that uh, is standing behind these walls and it's quite, kind of surreal. quite amazing and also to see the relationships that I, I feel very connected to him and there's some of his work that's just yeah I've, I've learned a lot I let's say since uh, being here and I'm definitely going to take that into my practice so I'm very excited it's, yeah. Daniel's process and Joseph Kyle my father's process very very similar um, you know, the process of the actual making of the work. And uh, also, I think, you know, one of the things I often say is, for me, I believe the single most important aspect of art is the act of art. It's when the artist is involved in that process of making art, when, uh, at the risk of sounding corny, in a sense, it's when we're closer to God than any other time. The ego is completely not a factor, uh, as the emotions are. It, is, um, and that uh, art, I know, is born out of necessity. An artist has to make art like we have to breathe. It's not. A, it's not a, a a choice. And I know with my father, and I know also know with Daniel that both of them had that very strong necessity and the process in talking and listening to Daniel talk over the last several days we've been spending time uh, that's ultimately the aspiration of course is that sense of going into that place where the divine exists within us and, you know and I do believe that art is one of the few physical manifestations of the existence of that within us and uh, Daniel Daniel's work really, really uh, demonstrates that for me as does my father's. And so there's a, a very definite relationship between yours and my father's work. It's yeah. really beautiful to see that for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's great to be yeah, great to see that too and explore that relationship. It's really interesting. Yeah. One, one last question. You're not knocking these out in the afternoon then. <laughs> I tried, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, it, there's quite a lot. It's, it's, I mean, I'm very, I'm very, I worked in kitchens for quite a few years, so I got very efficient at like multitasking and doing a lot at the same time. And uh, it taught me a lot about um, how to how to make the work and make it in an efficient way. That um, because the work for me, I'll come back to answering your question, but the work for me is 
they're all like studies. It's all about, I'm curious about what happens when this and this happens. So, so it's, I, I want to make the work as quick as possible, not because I want to get it out there, but because I want to figure out what's happening and then move on to the next thing and the next thing. So it's, it's quite a quick process, but that depends. I mean, for me, it, 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 it's, it's definitely a few weeks, but to me it seems quick. Um, but I work on multiple works at the same time. And one last thing. You're working with a whole spectrum of colour here. Yeah. And you're saying that the lines at the back are important, you don't lose them. Yeah. So, uh, do, you, do you use pigments with the same transparency in acrylic? Or, uh, so for example, a cadmium red versus a pearl or natural red, the different transparencies. So, that, right. that, does that feed into your process? Yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's really important to use the ones that are there as high. As the highest amount of transparency. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's really important because otherwise, they're also the, the work becomes too heavy, and it's really important that the work is breathing. So I, I, what's really important is that the, there's a so there's a lot of hard edged lines in the work, but I try to balance that with the transparency and the lightness of the work, so it really breathes, right? That it doesn't become too heavy. It's really important. And that's about. Um, <coughs> It's also a relationship to us, right? As we believe and we relate. That's important. Yeah, and the Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You went to the picture. Um, do you do it more aesthetic or dynamic? Sorry? Can you look to the video painting? Do you yeah. see it more as dynamic or more static? Um, interesting question. What do you see? I see it that way. Dynamic. And why? It's like waves. Waves. Oh, because it's waves. Yeah. yeah. For, for me, for me, uh, I would like that you see it like that. And, um, <laughs> and um, yeah, and I think because of all these different elements going on together, that it becomes this thing that is, depending how you look at it, depending on the perspective you have, uh, that those things are happening, and it is moving, it's, it's breathing, it's, it's an entity, but it is activated by you, the viewer, and um, that's really important to me. Uh, yeah. The same painting, um, in your process with all of that tape that was on there, right. were you aware of the softer roundness that it was creating? That it, like from each side, there's there's a roundness that creates towards the center. Or was that a byproduct? Um, well, when, when I was drafting the work, I, I I figured that that would happen. So it was something that I was expecting to a certain degree, but you can never fully control. Um, and, but yeah, it was kind of expected and hoping for. <laughs> yeah. Yes, is that maybe the thing? Um, the ones without red dots are still for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss up.